All right, thanks for having me. Thanks for showing up at uh, 9 a.m. in the morning. I uh, specifically know it's very early, <laughs> you know. Yeah, thanks for thanking me. You know, it was a Herculean effort. All right, so today I'll be talking about the chromatic null stone slots. And everything I say today will be joint work with Alan Yuan and Tomer Schlenk. Oh, and my handwriting tends to be pretty bad, so if it reaches a point where you cannot tell what a word says, you know, don't feel shy, ask what the word is, and I'll start to improve a little bit for a, you know, for a couple sentences. <laughs> Provably, yes, it will not be worse than Tomer's, but like, that's not, that's not a high target. You know, he spells badly enough that autocorrect is no help because he'll hit other words. <laughs> okay. Oh, and I'm being recorded, so I shouldn't make too many mean jokes about my co-op efforts. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, section one of this talk is going to be a, a little bit of a review of chromatic homotopy theory. The reason for that is when I wrote these notes, it was for a motivic conference where they didn't know so much of this. So I'm sure you'll all be bored, but in case you're not, you know, here's a, oh, some reminders of some stuff you already know. That doesn't start with N. So let me just start with, and I guess this would be chromatic homotopy in a much older style than a lot of what we've seen today. Um, or not the, today, this. <laughs> Vacuously true. Um, exactly, see? It was set theory only. Um, so if I have an R, a commutative ring, and I suppose S, another one, uh, and I have a map R to S, then we say this detects nilpotence. If for every map of compact R modules, so for every M to N and back R modules, um, S tensor over R with the map F is null if implies that F is tensor nilpotent. So this is that as we take tensor powers over R of this map F, we eventually get zero. Okay. So you know, something that I, you probably haven't seen necessarily before, but it's not so hard to sort of observe, is that, and here, commutative ring, discrete commutative ring, very classical stuff, is that, um, you know, an example of what you could use this property for is that seeing that the collection of residue fields of R detects nilpotence. Okay. And so, you know, the, what this example is supposed to tell you is this is some sort of statement that, um, you know, if you want to detect things up to nilpotence, uh, the Zariski topology has enough points for you to, you know, really see what's going on. Um, okay. And so, you know, as an example, I'm going to draw a Zariski spectrum of a ring on the board. Um, so Z localized at P, you know, we've got Q and we've got FP. Right. Yeah. And between them is a little specialization, and we should view these sort of points as one of them as FP is sitting in co-dimension one inside above this Q. That's the generic point. Um, and so where I want to go in with all this, it's, you know, what is the analogous picture um, in the category of spectra. And so that comes to us via the Devnots, Hopkins, Smith, Nilpotence theorem. So in S localized at P modules, uh, the collection of Morava K theories.
detect snow patterns. Okay, and so you know what are these guys? These Morava K theories. These are spectra K n n say greater than equal to zero. Uh, pi star of this guy Kn is a graded field given by Fp adjoin Vn plus or minus, and the degree of Vn is 2p to the n minus 2. So this guy is a graded field, so all modules over it are sums of itself. And you know, the picture of these being the sort of rings that are detecting nopotence tells us that we have this picture of the category P local spectra where at the top we have this generic point Q, and then we have K1, which also happens to be KU mod P, and then we have K2, and, and so on. And then, you know, at the very bottom here, I guess we have FP, and so this N for zero should be also be less than or equal to infinity. Um, okay, and so we sort of, we don't have just like one co-dimension, one guy, we continue on. And so chromatic homotopy theory is all about, and let me draw some little specializations. It's all about studying sort of formal neighborhoods of these points and then trying to glue them back together into an understanding of B local spectra. Um, okay. So now, yeah, I'm gonna need the board for this. I think I'm the first person to reach this configuration in this conference. <laughs> no one else has had this middle gap up here. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn the heat up from here on out. So construction class theorem with very long attributions. So this is gonna be due to Morava, Hopkins and Miller, And then Gores and Hopkins. And then Lurie. Which is what we want like to do is we'd like to produce so those KNs can really never be more than E1. And we would like something that is more than that. And I mean this is a feature of higher algebra that you don't really have quotients in as strict a sense as you want but you typically can get formal neighborhoods. And so we'd like to have a formal neighborhood of you know, the point N, and uh, you really can get this. And these are the, the so-called Morava E theories or Lubin Tate theories. So suppose that we have A, a perfect FP algebra, commutative, um, and G, a formal group of height exactly N, over A, uh, they construct a K on local commutative algebra E of A with G such that the homotopy groups of this guy or a formal power series ring on n minus one variables, and it's two periodic over the vit vectors of A. And we mark these with some degrees, so all these guys are in degree zero. And this guy today I will put in degree minus two. Okay, and so let me just remark that, um, well, when this guy A was no Ethereum, uh, then this uh, pi zero of 
that needs an extra parenthesis, um, that is going to be the uh, Lubin-Tate deformation space of this guy G. And so it'll be the, the universal deformation. Um, and let me also just remark that, you know, once, well, if A is a separably closed field, uh, then in that setting, all formal groups of height equals n are going to be isomorphic. And in particular, we can drop this G from notation because up to choice, there's only one. You know, we can always find an isomorphism of those formal groups to get make these objects isomorphic. So in my notation, once these things become separably closed, or at least or algebraically closed, then the G will go away from my notation. Okay. So now I've sort of said a bit about chromatic and I've set up kind of the players that, you know, they're going to appear throughout this talk. It's going to be about these E theories and what I can say about them um, and what special properties they have. Now it's time to say a bit about Nolstall and Satsas. So, What is a null stone sots? I really regret using such a long word in a paper. Um, okay. So let me recall what Hilbert's null stone sots says. So theorem is due to Hilbert. Um, so suppose K is an algebraically closed field. Well then, if I have a collection of polynomials in a polynomial ring, so let's say F1 through FR, and these guys are living in K, adjoining X1 through XS, and then I have this ideal they generate, there should be commas, then, and I assume that I is not the unit ideal, Then the FIs have a common root. Okay. So that's a pretty great theorem. I liked it quite a bit because it, you know, it said I could think about geometry instead of algebra, and then I kind of never went back to commutative algebra. Um, but unfortunately, if you want to like move this theorem over to other places, it's pretty specific to talking about commutative rings. I mean, it's referring to a polynomial ring and certain polynomials and certain ideals, and you might not be able to make sense of that in too general of a context. But actually, it's not so hard to rewrite this as something that's quite a bit more mobile. Um, so let me make a first rewriting of what I've written here. So I could, instead of saying a finite list of polynomials in a polynomial ring, I could say, well, that's a presentation of the quotient algebra. And this is saying it's not the zero algebra. So I could have stated this as saying if R is a finitely generated K algebra and R does not equal zero, then there's a retraction of the unit map. And so that's just a restatement of that, but we're getting much closer here to uh, something that you can state in a lot of different places. You know, we've moved from sort of something specific to polynomials and ideals to something about just a finitely generated object. And you know, there's a, you know, a lot of simple replacements you learn to do, and uh, one of them is when you see finitely generated, you can often just replace that with the word compact, and then you can say things in whatever category you want. Um, and so, let me come over here. Oh, this is actually pretty good, because then this definition will stay up for a while. Okay, so an object x in some category c is, and let's say c at least has a terminal object, Nolstall and Satsian. <laughs> if, I mean, there's just no hope. I, this board is not wide enough to contain these words. If any C in, you know, the category sliced, if for any R sliced under X, that's compact under X, um, admits a retraction.
any non-terminal. Admits a retraction, x goes to r, and then there's some retraction back down to x. Okay. And so that's, it's kind of cute that you can uh, rewrite this null stalin in such a categorical way so that it makes sense in an arbitrary category, but without any sort of existence theorem, it's a little bit of a lame duck. So let me give you a little bit of an existence theorem. So let's say C is presentable, uh, compactly generated, um, and it has this terminal object, it's called bullet, um, is a strict terminal object. which is also compact. Okay, what does strict mean? I think I heard even someone say that in the background. What is strict? Um, yeah, it's a non-standard term. I didn't know it before I needed a, a single word so that I could be you know, more obtuse than usual. Um, a terminal object is strict if when you map out of it to something, you, I guess, that, yeah, that's fine. Um, you either get the null set or you get point. And so you get the empty set if, uh, well, on my notes, both conditions are just x isomorphic to terminal object. If this is not true, and if it is isomorphic. So a terminal object is strict if being the terminal object is the same as having a map from the terminal object. And examples are categories like rings, where for rings, being the terminal object, that is say the zero ring is detected by the equation one equals zero, and there's only one ring where the equation one equals zero is satisfied. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a lot of ex oh you know this theorem doesn't have a, this proposition doesn't have a statement at the moment <laughs> then every let's say y in c has a map out to a most Sotsian object. Okay. And so what does this say? This says there's a lot of no and Sotsian objects. You can basically hit them starting from any point in your category. And so now let's give some examples of categories where these sorts of things are satisfied. So we've already discussed commuter of rings. And you know, this is where Hilbert started. You know, ring satisfies this as well. And uh, you know, if you're not so taken with all this abstract stuff, and when I start start discussing E infinity rings and really getting into it, you know, you just want to zone out. Try and come back to me at the end with an answer to what the null stolen Sotsian objects are in ring. I'll put a so question mark here specifically because I haven't solved it. I don't know anyone who knows the answer, so your name could go here. <laughs> um, And commutative algebras and spectra, no idea. Um, you know, harder than this question, algebras and spectra. I mean, I'd be shocked if it's easier, but I can't. It's hard to prove something's harder or easier than something else. Um, and then on this column, we'll get to some examples that are a little closer to my heart. Oh, like this one. That's what I'm going to discuss today. What are the null and the on objects in commutative algebras and can local spectra? Um, of course, I can continue just giving examples of categories where you have this question of what are the most Stalin-Satian objects. You know, we could talk about algebras and can local spectra, and we could talk about, I can't read my notes there, so that example is not getting written. Um, um, and you could talk about norm algebras, the category of norm algebras in the sense of Bachman and hoi -Wah. You know, that's another example of a category of objects that are kind of like rings. And oh, and another sort of example is you could say like a C alge cat perf. And you could add all sorts of decorations to this. So somehow 
This guy you could view as a categorification of this question, and if you put a KN there, you could view it as a categorification to this question that I don't have an answer to. Um, so these are all examples where these rather weak conditions are satisfied. You have a strict compact terminal object, and it's a compactly generated presentable category. So you've got many Nostal and Satsian objects. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the condition is vacuum. I think the definition needs to be rigged so you just say terminal mean is not null Satian. Okay, so you know that whatever you have, whatever object you have. Yeah. Um, Okay, and so I had to do it at some point. <laughs> you know, it might as well have been then. Okay, so theorem. So suppose you have some R in commutative algebras in K and local spectra, then this guy R is null stall and Satsian. All right, I'm just going to write NS from now on. I don't think there will be any objections. Um, if and only if R is equivalent to E. I think you can see them. They're just not both obviously Fs. <laughs> um, if and only if E is isomorphic to E of L, where L is some characteristic P algebraic like the closed field. Okay, and let's say theorem two is uh, given an R in C alg SPKN, the collection of maps out to E theories, so the collection of maps. R to E of L, uh, jointly detect null potence. So, okay. <clears throat> so, you know, up there we saw a little bit of some basic algebra. And you know, saying that the Zariski spectrum has enough points, and I justified that by saying you can detect null potents at residue fields, and you know that these residue fields they have algebraic closures. I actually didn't say the algebraic closures; I just assumed you knew that, um, and that those were the null and satsian things. And now we have this whole picture over here in the chromatic setting. We have that any R has a lot of maps out to these null and satsian things, which are E theories of algebraically closed fields, and you have enough maps out to jointly detect null potents. And so this is some sort of weak statement of having enough points, and if you wanted to start to do, you know, algebraic geometry inside, you know, K and local stuff, this might be a result you want to start out with to, you know, say that there's some geometry here, not sort of just some, you know, formal, you know, formal properties you can set up. It remains to be seen whether that geometry will materialize. Okay. And I should say that sort of these, this, you know, this, you could interpret this as a really strong closure property of E of L. You know, that it's, you know, any, for things under E of L, it's very easy for them to map back to E of L. Um, and this is sort of prefigured by, you know, Rognes introduced Galois extensions of ring spectra. And then uh, Baker and Richter proved that, um, that E of L is algebraically closed in that sense. So that's sort of a, 
closure under algebraic or under Galois extensions uh, property. Um, and so, you know, this is some strengthening of that in some sense. Okay. And so now, let me get back to this board. So theorem one and two are going to follow from theorem three with work. And theorem three is, you know, sort of, now I'm going to unwind to a simpler statement that I can try and explain the proof of to you guys. Um, so so suppose you have some R commutative algebra and can local spectra. Uh, there is an A. Some perfect FP algebra. Perfect. Control dimension zero, and so formal group G over A, and a nilpotence detecting map out to an E theory of A and G. So nilpotence detecting map. Okay, so that's what we're going to focus on from here, and sort of those are just corollaries that you unwind out of this once you have this. A single nilpotence detecting map out to some E theory, not of a field anymore, but of something of curl dimension zero. Um, you know, perfect in curl dimension zero, you could recombine it to perfect in von Neumann regular. Um, okay. So let me start with a couple quick reductions before we really get into discussing the body of how you go about doing this, which is, well, I have R mapping to E of L tensor R. And from now on, I really am going to be just working in the KM local category. Um, and so this map detects nilpotence. By Devonaut, Tuffman, Smith. So we can replace R by E of L tensor R, i.e. we get to assume R is an E of L algebra. This is great because, you know, I understand a couple things about the can local sphere, but not so many, but I understand a lot of things about E of L. Um, so now let's start to head towards the proof of this theorem. So let me start with an easy case. So I'll write this as an example. This is somehow, you know, one of the most important cases of this theorem that you really have to you know, the whole argument orbits around. So if R is isomorphic to E of AG for some A and G set of those conditions, then the identity map is good enough. Okay. And so now the rest of the proof resolve, revolves around looking at this example and looking at our ring R and asking ourselves, well, why isn't R already an E theory? And what can we do about it? Okay, so, you know, there's a couple different reasons R might not be an E theory. So, one, so E theories have entirely even homotopy groups. Uh, somewhere up here, you'll probably see the homotopy groups of E theory listed and the generators of all even numbers. So, you know, why might R not already just be this guy? R might not be even. Nothing except R. Yeah. Uh, well, not any spectrum, a uh, K and locum commutative algebra, but yes, I'm, we're wondering why isn't R our arbitrary thing already in E theory? I mean, it'd be really nice if we just like wondered about that hard enough and it just was. Like, it would, <laughs> like wouldn't that make this like, 
It would simplify so many things. <laughs> but unfortunately, odd, odd numbers exist, and so that's one of the obstructions. So we're going to need to do something about those pesky odd numbers. And you know, unlike in Jeremy's talk, I can't just ignore odd numbers silently. I really have to deal with odd numbers. OK, and uh, you know, what are some other you know, properties of E theories that an arbitrary ring might not, might, sat might not satisfy? Oh, and I guess after this point, we're really assuming it's an E of L algebra. And because it's an E of L algebra, we can take the maximal ideal in pi 0 here and push it forward. And when you mod out by that maximal ideal in an E theory, you get something perfect. And so pi 0 of R mod M you know, might have an element x might not have all people's roots. And then, you know, a third thing you could be worried about is, okay, you know, maybe x has all p roots, but some pi zero, some element of pi zero mod m, let's call it this y this time, uh, might be nilpotent. Perfect rings don't have nilpotence, so that would be an issue for us. A free algebra on an odd degree generator, um, it's going to get harder to just, well, a free algebra on an even degree generator, um, it's going to be a polynomial algebra, and therefore mod m, it'll be polynomial, so you'll have things that don't have all p roots. Um, making a nilpotent, uh, let me take the uh, monoid ring of the natural num the monoid ring of the quotient of the natural numbers by five. <laughs> so that'll be a thing with a generator t and t to the fifth is zero. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, you know, it is also fine if these are unsatisfiable because the goal is to, to make these go away as best we can. <laughs> okay. So now, let me state sort of an important lemma, and then we have to get into the erasing game. So, you know, so, so what is the, the, the overarching strategy here? It's that we want to isolate a problem we have you know, typically one of these, and we want to say that R maps out to some R prime where we've solved that problem. You know, we have some X doesn't have P roots, we map forward to a new R prime where it does. We have some nilpotent element, we map forward to something where that nilpotent element is dead. You know, we have some odd class, we, we map forward to somewhere that R class goes to zero. And if we can do that once, we can do that transfinitely, and, and we can prove the theorem. Okay. And so, in order to make that a, an actually reasonable strategy, you know, we need the following lemma, which is that maps that detect nilpotence are closed under base change. So maps, or co-base change, since I'm talking about rings. So maps that detect nilpotence are closed under co-base change. So let me, and transfinite composition. Let me just draw out the Cobase change. That would be like if I have A mapping to B, and this detects nilpotence. And I have A mapping down to C, and I take D to push out all of a sudden, you know, some category of commutative algebras, then this map also detects nilpotence. Okay. Let me ask if there's any questions while I'm uh, waiting for a while.
Okay, so let's talk about odd elements first. Yeah, so suppose we have some alpha, let's say living in pi 1 of r, our EL algebra. And you know what we'd like to do is we'd like to map out to something where alpha goes to 0 so that we can then transfinitely iterate that procedure and then you know, take the colimit and get some replacement for r that's now even. OK, so how, you know, how will we do that? How do you remove an odd degree element? Let me specify that this alpha is not in 0. Well, you can take the free algebra on alpha in degree 1. And we have this map h that goes back down to e of l. And this is the map that sends alpha to 0. Actually, let me change this to z. We have another map down to r. And this is the map that sends z to alpha. And because this is a free algebra, it's not so hard to make this map. It's a free algebra. So to make a map out of it, we just have to pick where this z goes, and we pick alpha. Then right here, I can put r prime, defined to be the push out. And now since z1 goes to alpha, but it also goes to 0, down here it's going to go to 0. OK. And now, you know, I referenced that lemma as being all important to the argument. And the reason is, is that, you know, what we want to show is that this map detects nilpotence and sends alpha to 0. But by, under this co-base change, all we need to do is show that this map detects nilpotence. And so what previously was a statement about an infinite amount of, you know, R that we have very little real control over what an arbitrary EL algebra R looks like um, and you know what the odd elements behave like in there. There's actually one universal example of what we need to do, and that's a very well-controlled algebra because it's the free algebra on an odd degree generator. Okay. And so now, now that I've isolated a core claim about a very specific thing, let me not say so much more other than that. To show this map detects nilpotence, uh, you know, what you really need is you need a strong um, form of the main nilpotence theorem proved by Matthew Neumann and Noel. So, And so the idea here is, is that, you know, that theorem says that um, you can detect things being nilpotent in an E infinity ring if you look at FP and Q in the homotopy groups in the E infinity ring. And, you know, that is somehow the, the core input that lets us, if you stare at this question long enough, you can actually reduce it to a rational problem that that al then allows you to solve. Um, you know, the, you know, a key point to recognize here is that this guy, its homotopy groups are p-torsion free. So often you can detect sort of what you need to have happen after rationalizing, and then you argue, okay, now I know this element is p-torsion, but there's no p-torsion in sight. Okay. So, now I'm going to move on to sort of the next big example I need to cover. Um, and whereas in this case it was very easy to write down the universal map that I needed to say something about, um, in the second case, which is where I would like to adjoin p through, it's, it's rather difficult to write down the universal map, but once it exists, the detecting nilpotence property is essentially immediate. So let's Look at this two. So we have, recall, we have this m sitting inside of pi zero e of l. Okay, and we've got pi zero of r mod m. And this might be, fail to be perfect. So let's pick an x 
in there, or let's pick an x bar that doesn't have roots. Uh, pick x and pi zero var lifting x bar. Okay. Um, here I need an aside that I've sort of already mentioned, which is that from work of Kashiwabara and Strickland, we know that E of L adjoins some generator freely in degree zero, Z is even, and it's, and pi zero of it, is the emmatic completion of a polynomial algebra. So is emmatic completion of a polynomial algebra. OK. So now, so let B be the following thing. It's going to be I take pi zero of E of L adjoin Z in degree zero, and then I'm going to mod out by M, and I'm going to take the direct limit perfection. Okay, so be this aside, this ring is just some polynomial ring, and when I take the direct limit of perfection of that, you know, all these polynomial generators, they gain all pth roots. Um, and now, suppose we had A map G from E of L join Z in degree zero to the E theory associated with B, which induces the natural map from pi zero of E of L mod M to pi zero of, sorry. There should be an adjoint z there. Pi zero adjoint. Mod m, where this is the direct uh, perfection map. So this is an inclusion there on pi zero mod m. Then, because this map right here is faithfully flat, this map right here would also be emmatically faithfully flat. And being faithfully flat is enough to know that you detect nilpotence. So we'd have this map G that would detect nilpotence. So let me just say that G would detect nilpotence. And what we could do is we could form a square E of L, Z in degree zero, mapping to R by sending Z in degree zero to X. And here we would map out by G to E of B. And we could say R prime is the push out. Okay. So again, we just needed like one map with some good properties and we're able to adjoin roots to anything in pi zero mod M. And this time, rather than it being difficult to prove that the map detects nilpotence, what it does on homotopy groups already implies that, but what's hard is to produce a map that does this. And let me, oh, I can erase while I, oh, I have a blank board up here. Okay. Okay, so, you know, there's sort of a contrast here between how I specified this map and, you know, what, you would, what would make it easy to make. So because this is a free algebra, to make a map out of it is essentially, not essentially, it is exactly equivalent to saying where this z0 goes. So choices of a map like g are in bijection with pi zero of e of b. And that's one sort of basis by which you can specify these maps, but the condition is in terms of what it does on homotopy groups. And now there's a, you know, a whole theory related to figuring out the relation between these, and that's the theory of power operations. So this algebra is a polynomial algebra, and its basis are the power operations on this class Z0. And so 
you know, where do these polynomial generators go? You send z0 somewhere, and then you have all these power operations acting on homogeneous or community of algebras, and the other generators go to the poly operations on those, and this condition here is stated in terms of the reduction mod m. So, you know, what we need to contrast is we need to say I have a list of values of power operations mod m, and I want to find an integral element such that the power operations on it after reducing mod m give me that specific value. And now you can package that all together into one statement that makes it easy to uh, you know, produce this map, which is that, um, so you have these t algebras in the sense of RESC, which encode a commutative ring with power, op, you know, E-theory power operations, and you have a forgetful functor down to, let's say, um, commutative rings under pi zero of E of L. So there's a forgetful functor like that, and emits a right and a left adjoint. And so you can call this one free, and you can call this one co-free, And, you know, the theorem that you know, we end up proving is that pi zero of E of, let's say, A is exactly, let me give a name to this co-free thing, I'll call it the T vit vectors, an analogy with how if here I had delta rings or lambda rings or theta rings or something that's all the same, just some Greek letter, um, and commutative rings, you can make the free one or you can make the co-free one, and the co-free one is given by the Vit vectors construction. Um, and if, yeah. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, what, that's just to motivate us calling these the T Vit vectors. And in the same way that pi zero of K theory was the Vit vectors of, you know, pi, of E1 is the Vit vectors of A, this guy is exactly the T Vit vectors on A. And so this is really great because now this thing we're mapping into, right, we need to pick an element in this thing, but it's something co-free, and so we're mapping from something free to something co-free, we adjoint the co-free guy over, and now we just need to pick the ring map mod M we want. And so, now, under this adjunction, this just uniquely specifies one of those. Okay. No. There we go. Uh, a there is going to be a perfect FP algebra. Okay, so now I've got one more thing to discuss, which is about 
nilpotent elements, and I suppose also something to say about curl dimension zero. And I'm going to say those simultaneously. So this guy, pi zero of r mod m, might have nilpotence. and not be equal to dimension zero. Okay. And you can solve both of those problems at once. So being reduced of curl dimension zero that's the same as saying that for every x there exists a y such that x, y, x equals x, yeah. So this is sort of a, a partial inverse, so it's saying that um, essentially up to being an item potent, you can invert elements. And so that's going to allow us to simultaneously do those two conditions. And now solutions to that sort of equation are the same as saying that um, if I have a map k adjoint x into my, into my thing here, then I have this map where I invert x and where I send x to 0. And it's asking for a lifting like this. OK. And so you can see being reduced of curl dimension zero is some sort of condition about pulling the origin out of A1. Now, suppose we have some um, W in pi zero of R mod M, and then I take the tilt of this. So the reason taking the tilt as a safe operation here is if we've already finished solving problem two, mod m, we have all pth roots. So if we have some element that's nilpotent, it is in the image of the map from the tilt. And so we can pick such a, a uh, sequence of roots, and, and, and that's our w we want to be thinking about. Um, now, the thing about the tilt is that the tilt is actually a really well-behaved functor. It's the uh, right adjoint to the spherical bit vectors functor. And so, you know, if we have this w, that always lifts uniquely to a map of the form e of k adjoin t 1 over p infinity. So this map down to r, and let me call this like w tilde. And now we can also take f here, the map obtained by splitting out that origin. So now this is going to be t1 plus or minus 1 over p infinity times e of k. Well, let me write this as times k on the inside. The functor commutes a product, so they're the same. And again, we can take a push out, and that will that will uh, solve this equation. And once you've do, done that to every element, you know you'll have something that's reduced to chrome dimension zero. Okay, so you know we have these three maps that I've now introduced f, g, and h. There's f, there's g, and there's h. And so now, you know, a lemma here is that yeah, k is l. Okay, so if we have some r that's orthogonal to f, g, and h. So that is, you know, we have the, we have some r that's any map in can be extended across f, g, and h. Then r is equivalent 
to some E of A. And so this lemma is a not particularly difficult lemma that sort of builds on the sort of characterization of Morava E theories you see in work, of course, Hopkins and Lurie. Okay. And so that's about it. I mean, at this point, you know, you can use Quillen's small object argument to say that, well, if you have a couple maps and you want to produce something orthogonal to them, you just take, keep taking pushouts in a transfinite composition in a big co-limit, and eventually you will be orthogonal. You know, at each step along the way, you produced maps that detected nilpotence. Maps that detect nilpotence are closed under transfinite con compositions, and if you detect nilpotence, you can't be the zero algebra because the zero algebra does not detect that one is not a nilpotent. Um, and so at the end of the day, we've, we've proved the theorem. So I don't know, I'll give myself a check mark. All right. And uh, I guess, you know, I've neglected to tell you why we could care about this at all. Um, so let me, in this little box here, you know what's funny? I have one more page in my notes where I really give like a nice sort of account of the history and like, you know, the provenance of these things. But instead, I'm always confined to about like half a square meter at the corner of a board with two minutes. And I have to give the really short version um, where I just say, um, so Alan has this great paper. So Alan's great paper where he shows that if you start with an, you know, an algebraically closed field L, then you look at, and this is, and then you look at E of L, this is this K and local ring, and then you look at K of E of L, and then you K and plus one localize it, but this is not zero. And so this gives an example of chromatic redshift where this guy living at height n, we applied K theory and it, something showed up one height higher. Um, you know, and this is sort of first observed by uh, Rognus and Asonian Rognus, and, you know, an increasing library of examples, and this is like a very systematic family of examples. And what's really great about Alan's paper is it's so short and so simple, and like it just, it's one of those things where you look at it and it's just like, that, that, how do you come up with that trick? And it's funny because, you know, when he talks about this, I, I feel like he struggles to fill an hour, you know? <laughs> right, it's like, you know, if it was me giving that talk, like 15 minutes in, I would just put my chalk down and say, there, you know. I'd, I'd let it stand on the fact that it's something so cool you can say it so, so quickly. Um, I think Alan fills the hour, though. Um, bit of a difference in styles. Um, but yeah, that's really great. And the thing is, is that what this does is this lets us say that for a commutative algebras in general, they're always going to bump up a height because, well, now, by this theorem three up there, or maybe, yeah, it's still up there. Um, we can always make a map R, so let's say R is KN local, or even KN locally not zero. Well, then we can make a map out to some E of L, and we can hit this with KN plus one local K theory, so KN plus one local K theory. Well, that's gonna map out to LKN plus one K of E of L, and that's not going to be zero. And a great thing about like rings and detecting whether or not they're zero is this guy's zero if the equation one equals zero is satisfied. This is a ring map. One does not equal zero here, so one does not equal zero here. So this is not zero. And so in this sense, at the end of all of this, this is like the major application we have of all of this, is that we see that you know, we, we observe chromatic redshift for, you know, E infinity rings and not for anything else other than E infinity rings. Um, what's kind of funny here is this, you know, this is sort of an analog of a result of Suslin. And in Suslin's paper, you know, it's all about sort of getting the, you know, seeing that K theory of algebraically closed fields goes up a height. Um, and I'm sure it's no more than a line to conclude that well, that means you have to go up a height for every other thing because everything maps to an algebraically closed field. Um, and I guess that kind of shows, uh, well, it took a lot of work to uh, generalize that one line. <laughs> you know? Okay, thanks for listening.
We'll see, rather than more applications, it's more like, uh, you know, just talking a bit about the history of Redshift and sort of prior results and giving sort of a fair, balanced account. Um, and then I, I wanted to say, okay, so this is really sort of the analog of Thomason's results and, or Suslin's results, Suslin's results. Um, but you could really want sort of, you know, higher versions of a whole package of like height through to height one results that we do have. Like you could want an analog of Quill and Lichtenbaum. You could ask, well, Quill and Lichtenbaum doesn't hold for all rings. It holds for sufficiently finite rings. And so you could ask, well, what is the correct collection of rings such that some sort of Quill and Lichtenbaum would hold? So that Quill and Lichtenbaum would be like, there exists a finite complex F such that F tensor K of R is bounded. And you could ask what finiteness conditions you need for this to be true, or you could give, you could assert a finiteness condition and say for those it does happen. And now, like the proof I know of Quill and Lichtenbaum goes through Blockado and says, okay, well, we really have Blockado, and in under finiteness assertions, Blockado gives us an answer that sort of exists in a finite range, so we get Quill and Lichtenbaum. Um, and so you could ask, like, is there a Blockado conjecture lurking in the background that would illuminate what the right finiteness conditions in a higher Quill and Lichtenbaum are? Um, and you know, you know, a higher Blockado would sort of identify a class of rings, kind of like fields. And then it would say that the associated motivic filtration on their Km plus one local K theory has some very simple form that sort of is so confining if, if the guess is right that sort of things just have to shake out in a really nice way. So that, those are the sorts of things that exist on this page. You can come down and read the page if you want. Yeah, so in uh, Jacob's Elliptic 2, he gives a criterion for how, like, what are the set of maps out of a Morava E theory to something else. Um, and the conditions he has on the target are essentially evenness being complex or, well, evenness implies complex orientable. And um, I think that's basically it for describing the set. And so, there might be like one other condition, but basically once one, two, or three are satisfied, um, you can use what, you know, that proposition buried in elliptic two to produce a map out, and it also sort of describes how the map should behave on homotopy groups. Um, maybe a different account of this is that you have the spherical VIT vectors into E of L algebras and its adjoint tilt, and this is not just an adjunction, it's a, it exhibits perfect algebras as a, sitting fully faithfully inside. So there's, a, there's always a co-localization map from some E theory to, to R. And that co-localization map is exactly um, mod M, the map from the tilt to the, um, the tilt mod M to the pi zero mod M. And since you can detect equivalences mod M, once you know there's no M torsion, you can kind of go from there in terms of saying, well, No, it will be an e it, 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 it's easy to produce a map from an E theory because of this co-localization. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, this E co-localization map always exists and it's not so hard to check its equivalence. <coughs> um, but I think going into some of this, the, the, the thing of Lurie I mentioned might go into setting up some of this stuff, so. Thank you.